loose weapons increase the threat that groups or individuals <clears throat> might reignite hostilities. And around the world, landmines rendered Secretary of State Clinton earlier today will lead this as the U.S. House is gaveled back into session. ...for enhanced reliability in the transportation of the nation's energy products by pipeline and for other purposes. Chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one-minute speeches per side. And for what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? That objection. Mr. Speaker, the late Czech champion of freedom, Václav Havel, once explained the battle between good and evil as an eternal, never-ending struggle waged not just by good people against evil people. It takes place inside everyone. It is what makes a person a person and life, life. So anyone who claims that I am a dreamer who expects to transform hell into heaven is wrong. I have few illusions, but I feel a responsibility to work towards the things I consider good and right. I don't know whether I'll be able to change certain things for the better or not at all. Both outcomes are possible. There is only one thing I will not concede, that it might be meaningless to strive in a good cause. Mr. Havel, for your meaningful life's work engaging the affairs of state and of the heart for right and good, thank you and God bless you. As your mortal struggle ends and you finally rest in peace amidst the freedom of your beloved republic, I yield back. What purpose does the gentlelady from Ohio rise? That objection. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Here we go again. Another phony crisis courtesy of the extremist bah humbug House Republicans. House Republicans have never met a deal they couldn't find a reason to dislike. Now they've resorted to fighting their colleagues in the other body to avoid doing something positive for our country. Right now we could be cutting the payroll tax. We could be extending jobless benefits and approving a Medicare fix for our doctors. The average American family in Cleveland, Lorraine, Sandusky, and Toledo now face a $1,000 tax hike because of the Republican game of chicken. American middle class families want the payroll tax cut or their taxes will go up on average about $1,000. Millions of Americans need unemployment benefits, but House Republicans need to pick a fight. And it doesn't matter with whom. If they can't fight with Democrats who are standing up for the middle class, they'll fight with their colleagues in the other body. Here's what I want for Christmas. I want the Republicans to care half as much about manufacturing jobs in America as they care about manufacturing crises. Now, wouldn't that be a holiday present? I yield back my remaining time. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Mr. Speaker, I wish to consent to address the House for one minute and revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, last Tuesday, House Republicans successfully passed a bill that protects every American taxpayer and promotes job creation by extending the payroll tax cut, reforming unemployment insurance, and providing Medicare payments to physicians for a year. Over the weekend, liberals in the Senate amended this legislation to provide for only a two-month fix. In an attempt to tie House Republicans' hands and force the two-month extension, Senate liberals led adjournment for recess. The American people deserve much better than this childish behavior when our unemployment rate has consistently remained above 8 percent for 34 months and over 25 million Americans are searching for work. Our sympathy to the people of the Czech Republic upon the death of former President Václav Havel, who was a brave patriot helping liberate Central and Eastern Europe from communism, leading to the establishment of the neighboring Slovak Republic. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we will never forget September 11th in the global war on terrorism. What purpose does the gentleman from Virginia rise? Without objection. It's Grinch time in Washington, Mr. Speaker. One is incredulous that the House Republicans would oppose a tax cut for 160 million Americans, but that's just what they're going to do today. Is this bill perfect? No. There are aspects upon which both sides disagree, but it is the area of agreement that should be the most important. Congress stops playing hostage politics and halts the tax hike on 160 million fellow citizens. Sa Saturday's Senate vote was 89 to 10 
not just liberals, I say to my friend from South Carolina, with all members of the Senate leadership, Republican and Democrat, voting in favor. If House Republicans vote against this compromise, they'll ring in the new year with a tax hike of their own making. If House Republicans were serious about wanting certainty, as they claim, they would vote for this bill today and guarantee that 160 million Americans won't pay higher taxes in January 1. Mr. Speaker, rejecting this bill and holding up the payroll tax cut and unemployment benefits will be a true example of how the GOP Grinch stole Christmas for 160 million Americans. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Ask permission to address the House for one minute, revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise today on behalf of the doctors around the country. As a physician and now a legislator, I'm personally devastated at the way our government continues to treat those who care for America's patients, particularly those who care for America's seniors. Physicians have staff to pay, electricity bills, building leases, numerous other costs associated with running a practice. The two-month patch that the Senate sent back to us as part of the payroll tax package does not provide doctors and their practices with the stability, stability that they need to do their job caring for America's seniors. At a time when American businesses need certainty, Congress gives them a brief and unpredictable and unreliable timeline. Two months of tax payment relief is just another short-term fix and is simply not good enough. Physicians deserve better. Patients deserve better. The American people deserve better. I will vote no on the Senate bill and encourage my colleagues to do the same. Then let's come back with a policy that will, for heaven's sakes, at least take us through the year ahead. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair lays before the House the following enrolled bill. H.R. 3672, an act making appropriations for disaster relief requirements for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, and for other purposes. For what purpose does the anxious gentleman from Ohio rise? Uh, without objection. Mr. Speaker, the President has said it would be inexcusable not to extend the payroll tax cut for a year. However, the Senate plan merely extends the plan for just 60 days instead of the full year extension, creating uncertainty for our job creators at a time when millions of Americans are out of work. It also creates more uncertainty about implementing the plans that we just learned today from the National Payroll Reporting Consortium. American families deserve better tax policy than two-month increments. Last week, the House passed bipartisan legislation that extends the payroll tax cut for a full year, which would save American households an average of $1,000 a year. It also extends unemployment benefits, ensures senior citizens have access to their doctor by preventing a cut in Medicare reimbursement rates. The worst part of the Senate plan is it puts new permanent fees on home mortgages to pay for 60 days of spending. This is an irresponsible and outrageous plan. Our bill is offset by reasonable spending cuts, not new taxes on hard-working, middle-class home borrowers. A full-year plan with no taxes is better than a two-month spending spree, which is nothing more than a political sideshow. I guess the senators were anxious to leave town and not finish their work, so I think we ought to call the Senate plan. I'll be home for Christmas. I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas rise? Request permission to address the House for one minute. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, each week my neighbors take the time to make their opinions known through emails, phone calls, and letters. Today's Pulse of Texas is from a federal employee in Humble, Texas, who recently wrote me with these wise observations. I am an 11-year federal and government employee who works hard, and yet I'm on a two- to three-year pay freeze while unemployment benefits are extended over and over again. I live in a house that I purchased because I could afford it. Yet my tax dollars go to bail out bad lenders and borrowers. My children go to colleges that they can afford. They all held jobs during college, and the oldest graduated with zero in her student loan debt. Yet now there's a plan to bail out those who went to schools above their means. Enough is enough. Please help break the cycle of entitlement and lack of personal responsibility that the government is fostering in this country. Mr. Speaker, America should be the land of freedom and opportunity, not more free stuff and entitlement. And that's just the way it is. For what purpose does the gentleman from Nevada rise? Without objection. Mr. Speaker, Nevadans tell me time and time again that they want some certainty in their lives. 
They want their elected leaders to move beyond patchwork agreements every single month. We passed a one-year package, fully paid for, that extends unemployment benefits while providing a pathway back to work, keeps an extra $1,000 in the pockets of Nevada's struggling families while protecting Social Security, and maintains access to health care for seniors and veterans by keeping doctors in Medicare. Throughout the entire negotiation process, the American people were assured that they would receive an entire year of certainty. Then the Senate pulled the rug out from underneath them. Passing a two-month extension now will put us right back here in February when we should be using that time to debate job-creating ideas. The House will stay here and work on this critical issue until it is resolved. The House agrees with the President and the American people. We need a one-year extension. Anything else will be judged as a failure to do our job. And I yield back the balance of my time. Pursuant to uh, Clause 4 of Rule 1, the following enrolled joint resolution was signed by the Speaker on Friday, December the 16th, 2011. House Joint Resolution 94, making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2012 and for other purposes. And Saturday, December 17, 2011, House Joint Resolution 95, making further continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2012 and for other purposes. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on motions to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote or the yeas and nays are ordered or on which the vote is objected to under Clause 6 of Rule 20. Recorded votes will, on postponed questions will be taken later. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2056 with Senate amendments. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 2056, an act to instruct the Inspector General of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to study impact of insured depository institution failures and for other purposes. Senate amendments. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, and the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank, will each control 20 minutes, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and to add extraneous material. Without to objection. Mr. Chairman, the bill before the House today is one that will provide much needed transparency to the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and the OCC bank examination and resolution procedures. First, I'd like to thank Chairman Bacchus and Subcommittee Chairwoman Capito, Ranking Member Frank, and Subcommittee Ranking Member Mahoney for their support of H.R. 2056. I'd also like to thank Senator Chambliss and his staff for working to pass this bill on the Senate side. We are pleased to have an agreement with the other chamber, which is highly unusual, and look forward to the outcome of this study. As I have said many times before, there is no greater threat to our communities than bank failures, especially in my state of Georgia. Since the House last debated this bill in July, more banks in Georgia have been closed by the regulators. Now 73 banks are no longer serving their communities, and 22 banks alone have failed in 2011. Sadly, there are some communities in my district that are no longer served by a community bank. I have often referenced the so-called 10 over 10. These are the 10 states that have had more than 10 bank failures since 2008. These 10 unlucky states are Georgia, Florida, Illinois, California, Minnesota, Washington, Michigan, Nevada, Missouri, and Arizona. In fact, six of the 10 states have had more than 10% of their banks fail in the last three years. Mr. Chairman, the deeper I dig into the actions of the FDIC, the Fed, and the OCC, the more concerned I am that our community banks are being regulated like public utilities rather than the job creators they are. H.R. 2056 is designed to cut through all the information to analyze the underlying fundamentals that continues to call bank failures across this country. The bill directs the FDIC uh, Investigator General, Inspector General, in consultation with Treasury and the Federal Reserve IGs to study the bank regulators' policies 
and practices regard to law share agreements, the fair application of regulatory capital standards, appraisals, the FDIC procedures for loan modifications, and the FDIC's handling of consent orders and cease and desist orders. Further, the GAO also has a study in the bill to pursue those questions that the FDIC IG is unable to fully explore, such as the causes of the high number of bank failures. The impact of fair market value accounting has been a tremendous impact on our banks. Analysis of this impact of the failures on the community banks is especially needed. The overall effectiveness of law share agreements for resolving banks is another thing that should be looked at very carefully. The changes made by the Senate now ensure that the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee will have a hearing on this important study once it is issued. I know this bill can never bring back the banks that have been lost in this crisis, but this bill and the study will provide Congress and the communities in my district and in other districts the information it needs to ensure these failures never happen again. I encourage all my colleagues to support this bill. And Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, gentleman from Massachusetts. I yield myself such time as I may consume. This was a matter brought to me by the gentleman from Georgia who just spoke and his Georgia colleague, the gentleman, Mr. Scott, who's a member of the Financial Services Committee, because of their understandable concern that the impact bank failures could have in the state they represent. I am very supportive. I do want to make clear that nothing in the passage of this should be taken as a criticism of the FDIC. I have been very impressed with the leadership that was given to the FDIC by the recently retired chair, Sheila Baer, an appointee of President Bush, who was not only, I think, a first-rate chair of the FDIC, but gave us a great deal of very useful advice as we dealt with financial reform. Bank failures are an unfortunate fact of life. We don't want them to be done unnecessarily, but neither can they be avoided. And obviously, in the overwhelming majority of cases, the problem is in the business community. The right to fail, as we must remind ourselves, is part of the right to do business. Having said that, I agree that what the FDIC does should be very transparent. And there is one aspect of what the FDIC does, not directly affected in this bill, but it's one that I think you have bipartisan agreement on in the committee, namely, and I will mention this because of its impact on our economy. Understandably, bank examiners felt very sensitive to criticism that during the first part of this century, they did not say no to enough loans. Loans were made in the mortgage field that shouldn't have been made. But you cannot retroactively go back and undo that by now being too tough and denying loans that should be made. And we have had a frustration on the part of members of our committee because we hear reports from people in the field in the community banks that bank examiners are being too tough. No one wants to encourage imprudent lending. And the bank regulators have tell us they agree with that. But I want to take every opportunity I can to remind the bank examiners that if they run into a situation in which no bank loan ever defaults, then they have been too tough because perfection is unattainable. And what we want to do is minimize the number of failures, but not rule them out altogether with a regime that will keep good loans from being made. Having said that, to go back to this, it is appropriate that we get a full study of what happens when a bank fails, and we would ask the FDIC, when they are dealing with a failed bank, to take into account the needs of that particular community so that the disposition is one that has some sensitivity. And uh, that is what I think is here. I would just say, with regard to community banks, there is a continued recognition they're important. And I would just note, in the financial reform bill signed last year, there were several provisions that were in there at the specific request of the community banks to help them. For example, one of the disadvantages community banks have felt is that people with large amounts to deposit would go to larger institutions because the limitation on deposit insurance would make them a little worried about going to a community bank. We increased that number from 100,000 to 250,000, which is a significant advantage for community banks over the prior situation. We also, for the first time in our history, changed the way in which assessments are levied on banks for deposit insurance 
by introducing a risk factor. Before the bill was signed, it was every deposit was levied the same amount of insurance cost. Now there is a risk factor, which means that dollar for dollar, the larger institutions which engage in riskier activities will be paying more than the smaller institutions. We also extended for a period, I would have liked to make it permanent, we didn't have the votes to do that, the transactional accounts. So yes, we are aware of the importance of, of community banks, and I would just re repeat what I said uh, at the first, because I have found surprisingly that not everybody listens to everything I say the first time I say it. Um, this is not meant as a criticism of the FDIC. It is a recognition of the importance of this process being open and that people understand it. And so I say to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, they were serving their constituents well by bringing this forward, and I hope the bill passes. I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserved, gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd like to uh, recognize the chair lady of the Financial Institutions, uh, Financial and Institutions Subcommittee of the Financial Services, the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Capito. Gentlelady from West Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Westmoreland for his leadership on this uh, topic. He has been very dedicated uh, to finding a solution here. He's worked with both sides of the aisle to find a way to uh, get to the transparency and accountability that, uh, that we need to have in terms of uh, the examination process with our community banks. And I know he has been a tireless advocate for the communities in his district. Uh, we actually went to Mr. Westmoreland's district to Noonan, Georgia, and had a, um, a, um, a legislative hearing. And we learned about the bank closures and the financial examination procedure. The regulators were all there. Financial institutions were there. But I think the one thing that struck me more than anything uh, in, in the course of the conversation was when a bank fails, and a lot of times a community bank is the only community bank, local bank, local ownership, know the people down the street. When that bank fails, it really guts the community in a way that's hard to describe. Uh, you know, the larger banks are there, branches are there, but it's still losing that uh, community anchor in a community bank can be a devastating thing, not just for individuals and families, but also for uh, the shop owner, the car dealer, the individual uh, farmer, the folks that rely on the relationship banking that you get so uh, spectacularly through a, a community bank, uh, you lose that. And uh, it, unfortunately, never to come back again in a lot of cases. And so I think that he's very concerned about that, and the people in Noonan, Georgia, and that district are very concerned. So this study, I think, will help us to see what's really going on here, pull the curtain back, look at uh, the uh, practices and the examination procedures. I know that Senator Levin made some technical changes in this, and I would like to thank Mr. Westmoreland for working with the Senator. Now, maybe that should be a life lesson for us here uh, in terms of what's going on today, but uh, I think we've reached a good consensus and a good agreement. Uh, we, will, we will hear the uh, results of this study in our, in our subcommittee and in our full committee to find out if, if we need to work with the regulators, change the regulations, make it so that, uh, that um, what the banking institutions are hearing on the ground from their regulators is actually what is moving forward in their written reports that are sent to Washington, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that uh, we're challenged with here in Congress certainly is creating jobs and creating a, a climate where banks are going to lend and creating a regulatory climate where banks are going to lend and want to lend to small businesses. And this issue that Mr. Westmoreland has highlighted I think will help us with that and hopefully uh, will undo some of the needless shackles that some of our uh, examiners are placing on our, on our smaller institutions or on our community banks to be able to get back lending and then our uh, small businesses and small job and job creators can then get back to the business of creating jobs and we can grow our economy. So I would like to again thank everybody for their efforts and I look forward to the passage of this bill and I yield back. Gentleman from Massachusetts. The gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to encourage all the members to vote for this. As the chair lady uh, mentioned, we had a field hearing in my district uh, with uh, my colleague, Mr. Scott from Georgia, also, and uh, I think it was a very good field hearing. And uh, we had testimony from bankers and from borrowers about the different regulations that had interfered with their ability to actually do business and the difference in the capital 
requirements that uh, the FDIC is putting on some of these banks. And we understand that the FDIC has to enforce the rules, but we do think there's some cases, as the uh, ranking member m mentioned, that there has been some overbearing on some loans that have been performing and are quality loans. And so we think that this study will obje uh, uh, at least open some people's eyes to this and give us a better idea on maybe some of the things that we need to do to make sure that our community banks stay open. Mr. Speaker, I have no further uh, requests for time, and I yield back the balance of my time. All time having been yielded back, the question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur in the amendment amendments to H.R. 2056? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the Mr. opinion of the chair, two-thirds of those being in the affirmative, the gentleman from Georgia. A quorum is not present, and I make a point of order that a quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Okay. For what purpose does the gentleman from Minnesota rise? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate Amendment H.R. 1801, the Risk-Based Security Screening for Members of the Armed Forces Act. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1801, an act to amend Title 49, United States Code, to provide for ex expedited security screenings for members of the Armed Forces. Senate Amendment. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Kravak, and the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Richardson, uh, will each control 20 minutes, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five, five legislative days which to revise and extend their remarks and include any extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Today, I rise in support of Senate Amendment H.R. 1801. H.R. 1801 represents a bipartisan, bicarmel effort in honor of the members of our armed forces by transitioning to an expedited, intelligence-driven screening process for all U.S. soldiers at our nation's airports. Shortly after the House passed H.R. 1801 by a vote of 404 to 0, the Senate, with support of the leadership and ranking member K. Bailey Hutchinson and Chairman J. Rockefeller, amended and passed H.R. 1801 by vo voice vote. I have had time to review the Senate amendment, and quite frankly, I think it improves the underlying bill. It requires a coordination between TSA and the Department of Defense in establishing the expedited screening process and clarifies that the TSA administrator retains the authority to require additional screening for a member of the armed forces should intelligence or law, law enforcement information raise any concerns. In addition, the Senate amendment allows TSA to include accompanying family military members in the expedited screening process, quote unquote, to the extent possible, end quote. Overall, the Senate amendment to H.R. 1801 improved the bill, and I urge my colleagues to support it. In close, I'd like to thank the Transportation Security Committee Mike Rogers and Ranking Member Sheila Jackson Lee and Homeland Security Committee Chairman Peter King and Ranking Member Benny Thompson for moving this legislation. Additionally, I would like to recognize and thank Senators K. Belly Hutchinson and Jay Rockefeller for their leadership in having the measure passed in the Senate. I'd also like to take some time to recognize some of the great staff on the House and Senate Homeland Committee, especially Mandy Bowers, Jennifer Arango, Amanda Powerick, uh, Stephen Geyer, Nicole Smith, Jay Vreberg, and Minnesota's 8th Congressional District Legislative Director Paul Blocker and his staff for all they have done in this process. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves, gentlelady from California. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of Senate Amendment 1801 and yield myself as much time as I may consume. And ladies recognize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as a member on the Committee of Homeland Security and as an ardent supporter of the men and women of the armed services, I'm pleased to return today as we're on the floor to consider the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1801, the Risk-Based Security Screening for Members of our Armed Forces Act. 
This legislation requires that the Transportation Security Administration to develop a plan for providing expedited screening to our military personnel at airport security checkpoints. The Senate amendment took a good bill and made it even better by expressly including new safeguards, as the gentleman from Minnesota just uh, alluded to. Last Congress, an earlier version of this legislation was accepted as an amendment on a bipartisan basis during the consideration of the Transportation Security Administration Authorization Act, which passed this House by 397 to 25, which was not acted upon by the Senate. H.R. 1801 properly recognizes the preciousness, nothing more important than time, to the patriotic men and women serving in our armed services without compromising aviation security. Our troops help keep our country safe. The least that we can do is devise methods while first ensuring safety to make sure that we can help speed up the screening process for our troops that are in uniform and traveling on airplanes while on official duty. Since 2001, there have been more than two million troops deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Our military presence in Iraq winds down, and more service members will thankfully be coming home. We owe it to them and all of our service members to do what we can to smooth their travels so that they can get home into the arms of their loving families. This legislation establishes adequate parameters that will ensure that our troops and their families including the 236,963 military personnel in my home state of California, will be given the opportunity to board an aircraft in a security-approved, expedited manner. If approved today, this legislation will go directly to the President for his signature. With the enactment of H.R. 1801, we have the opportunity to show the country that despite all the acrimony that has been punctuated in this 112th Congress, that we can accomplish good things for the American people when we focus on areas of common ground and compromise is embraced. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation with the Senate amendment. Mr. Speaker, before reserving the balance of my time, I'm compelled to build upon this current debate of H.R. 1801 to use this opportunity to urge the Republican leadership to bring to the floor additional bipartisan, common-sense Homeland Security legislation. This is the only bill reported by the Committee on the Homeland Security to be considered before the full House. There are a number of other Homeland Security bills on the Union calendar that warrant consideration by the full House as well. Among them is H.R. 1447, introduced by Ranking Member Benny Thompson. This legislation seeks to enhance TSA's coordination with private sector stakeholders on aviation policy. Also on the Union calendar is H.R. 1165, authored by Representative Jackson Lee, that would strengthen the TSA Ombudsman Office. Both of these bills were ordered and reported by the Committee on Homeland Security with bipartisan support. Despite having received bipartisan support from the committee, these bills have lingered on the union calendar for 40-plus days. I urge the Republican leadership to schedule these bills for consideration, and I'm confident that they will return to this House with overwhelmingly bipartisan support. With that, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. General Lady Reserve, gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, I have no more speakers. I'm prepared to close once the gentlelady Lady from California closes. General Lady from California. Mr. Speaker, um, I would like to yield two minutes to the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Berkeley, to speak on uh, this bill. Gentlelady from Nevada. I thank the gentlelady from California for yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think expedited screening for military service members is very important, and I'm glad that we're taking this bill up on a bipartisan basis. But I think there are some other things happening right now that should um, uh, take our attention and give it complete uh, attention to what we're going to talk about. With the highest unemployment rate in the nation, far too many Nevadans are worried about how we're going to make ends meet. And Nevada's middle class families who still have a job cannot afford a massive tax increase in January. But that's exactly the direction we appear to be heading towards uh, thanks to the Tea Party extremists in the House of Representatives. They're holding middle income families hostage. They're 
holding unemployed people hostage and they're holding senior citizens hostage. Why? Why one would ask to protect their special interest buddies. Wall Street millionaires, big oil executives and corporations that ship American jobs overseas. Mr. Speaker, enough is enough. It would be a disaster if the House Republicans refused to stand up to Wall Street today and extend the middle class tax cuts. In Nevada, 1.2 million people would see their taxes rise as much as $1,247 in January if this House of Representatives, led by the Republicans, don't do the right thing. With families struggling just to pay rent, put food on their tables, and put gas in their car, that's not acceptable. It's time for the Tea Party extremists in the Republican Party to let go and get their priorities straight. Middle class families in Nevada and across the country come first, not Wall Street millionaires. The time for political games is over. The clock is ticking. We have to take care of those that are unemployed through no fault of their own. We have to take care of middle income families that are struggling just to get by and need that extra million dollars, uh, extra thousand dollars this year and rather than have it taken out of their, uh, their taxes. And we need to ensure that seniors get medical care that they need. The time is over for game playing. On behalf of Nevada's struggling families, I demand, I demand that this House not allow a massive middle class tax increase and let us do our business before we go home and not shame ourselves and the American people by, uh, by leaving them in the lurch during the holiday season. And I applaud the um, Congresswoman for putting this legislation on and I hope that we truly address what's important to millions and millions of Americans across the country by uh, doing the right thing later this evening and making sure that uh, we pass this middle income tax cut and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, does the gentleman from Minnesota have any observations on the bill under consideration? I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, say again. Uh, do you seek to yield time or are you prepared to close if the gentlelady from California? If the uh, gentlelady has closed, I'm prepared to close. No, she hasn't closed. The uh, uh, gentlelady from California. Mr. Speaker, I have no more speakers. If the gentleman from Minnesota has no more speakers, I'm prepared to close as well. The gentlelady will proceed. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. As you've heard, Mr. Speaker, the measure before us represents discreet, common sense, Homeland Security legislation. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to vote in favor of this motion, to suspend the rules, and to concur in the Senate amendment of H.R. 1801 so that this measure can be presented to the President for his signature. I'd like to congratulate Mr. Kravick from Minnesota and the entire staff on both sides of the aisle for their work not only in this Congress but proceeding in the 111th Congress when this was brought forward in the prior TSA Act. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the gentlelady for refocusing the debate on who, it, who deserves most. Is that's our troops. That's what this uh, amendment is on. And I'd like to uh, thank all of my colleagues to support this. This is a very big amendment for our troops. Uh, let's give them a Christmas present that really means something to them, and I look forward to bringing home the Minnesota Red Bulls safe and sound. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1801? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, two-thirds of those present Mr. being in the affirmative, the gentleman from Minnesota. Mr. Speaker, I object to the vote of the grounds that a quorum is not present, and I make the point of order a quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. Texas? For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate Amendment to H.R. 1059, an act to protect the safety of judges by extending the authority of the Judicial Conference to redact sensitive information contained in their financial disclosure reports and for other purposes. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 1059, an act to protect the safety of judges by extending the authority of the Judicial Conference to redact sensitive information contained in their financial disclosure reports and for other purposes. Senate Amendment. 
Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, and the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, will each control 20 minutes, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous materials on the motion to concur uh, currently under consideration. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I support H.R. 1059 and thank Mr. Conyers for sponsoring it. I also thank Mr. Cohen and Mr. Johnson for serving as co-sponsors. H.R. 1059 promotes an important goal, providing security for federal judges. Under the Ethics in Government Act, judges and other high-level judicial branch officials must file annual financial disclosure reports. This requirement increases public confidence in government officials and better enables the public to judge the performance of those officials. However, Congress enacted legislation that allows the Judicial Conference to redact statutorily required information in a financial disclosure report where the release of the information could endanger the filer or their family. Those who seek to harm or intimidate federal judges might use a disclosure form to identify where someone's spouse or child works or goes to school on a regular basis. Individuals targeting judges for harassment have also been known to file false claims on property owned by judges and their families. Harassers could use judicial financial disclosure reports to more easily identify such property. The Judicial Conference delegated to its Committee on Financial Disclosure the responsibility to implement the financial disclosure requirements for judges and judicial employees under the Ethics in Government Act. The Committee monitors the release of financial disclosure reports to ensure compliance with the statute. In consultation with the U.S. Marshal Service, the Committee also reviews and approves or disapproves any request for the redaction of statutorily mandated information where the filer believes the release of the information could endanger the filer and their family. Under the Judicial Conference's regulations, no redaction will be granted without a clear nexus between a security risk and the information for which redaction is sought. The law has worked well through the years and has been reauthorized twice since 2001, but it expires at the end of this calendar year if we fail to act, an outcome that is unacceptable. Last year, the Marshal Service investigated and analyzed almost 1,400 threats and inappropriate communications to judicial officials, nearly three times as many threats as recorded in 2003. And there were more than 3,900 incidents and arrests at U.S. court facilities in 2010. Financial disclosures help maintain an open and transparent government but government transparency should not come at the cost of personal security for government officials. Judges and other judicial employees perform important work that is integral to our democratic system of government. In order to preserve the integrity of our democracy, we must protect the integrity of our courts. And that means ensuring the security of judges and other judicial employees from intimidation and threats. The Senate made two minor amendments to the bill, which we accept. The First Amendment involves an annual report that the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts submits to the House and Senate Judiciary Committees. The report summarizes the redactions made in the preceding year and explains why they were made. The First Amendment mandates that the report also be sent to the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee as well as the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. The Second Amendment sunsets the redaction authority after six years in 2017. Mr. Speaker, I support H.R. 1059 as amended by the Senate and urge my colleagues to extend the redaction authority. And I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, I want to commend the Chairman of Judiciary, Lamar Smith, for the uh, cooperation in bringing this bill uh, out of committee and through the Congress. On September 12th of this year, uh, my bill passed unanimously, and the requirement uh, that judges and judicial branch employees disclose their pers personal finances promotes openness in the federal government. It reduces the risk of corruption and prevents the appearance of impropriety 
and also uh, shed some transparency on what we do in the third branch of government. Unfortunately, sometimes these required disclosures can include critical information about a filer's residence, a spouse's workplace, a child's workplace, or a vacation home that has the potential to place members of the judiciary and sometimes their employees and their families at risk. And so uh, what we're doing here is uh, allowing a redaction uh, by uh, the uh, federal conference and the whole idea is to make sure that uh, some of the federal judges whose lives have been lost uh, and others whose family members have lost their lives by disgruntled litigants uh, will not be made uh, that available to them. The uh, Judicial Conference is very careful in granting redaction authorities and uh, although I would have preferred a permanent authority a redaction authority, I'm perfectly uh, willing to support uh, a six-year uh, authority with uh, extension possibilities. And so I look forward to uh, the President signing this bill into law immediately. And I reserve the balance of my time and since there are no other speakers, I will yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields his time. Gentleman from Texas. And Mr. Speaker, I'll yield back the balance of my time as well. While time having expired, the question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate amendment to H.R. 1059? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion is shared. Two-thirds of those present having voted in the affirmative. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, I object to the vote on the grounds that a quorum is not present. Make a point of order that the quorum is not present. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, further proceedings on this question will be postponed. <coughs> Does the gentlewoman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the House suspend the rules and concur in the Senate amendment to H.R. 515. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 515, an act to reauthorize the Belarus Democracy Act of 2004. Pursuant to the rule, the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Ross Leighton, and the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, each will control 20 minutes and the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Florida. I thank the speaker. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days to submit for the record statements and extraneous materials on this measure. Without objection. I thank the gentleman. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of 515, H.R. 515, the Belarus Democracy and Human Rights Act. Before I begin my prepared remarks, however, I would like to take a moment to honor the life of former President Vaclav Havel, an inspirational leader, a lifelong advocate for the cause of freedom. Throughout his lifetime, Havel was part of an incredible transformation of Czechoslovakia from an oppressive communist Soviet satellite to the free, democratic, independent nation that is the Czech Republic. Many people at that time had given up hope that such a transformation was possible. It was beyond their imagination. But Vaclav Havel never lost faith and believed that people yearning for liberty can come together and effect incredible change. Even following the liberation of his own country, Mr. Havel continued to champion the cause of the oppressed around the world, adding his voice to those calling for freedom in countries throughout Europe, the Balkans, and even in my native homeland of Cuba. 
as he eloquently said after the Velvet Revolution that brought liberty to his people. And I quote, none of us know all the potentialities that slumber in the spirit of the population or all of the ways in which that population can surprise us when there is the right interplay of events, end quote. It is therefore fitting, Mr. Speaker, that we come here today to consider this measure to support the democratic movement in a country relatively near Mr. Havel's homeland, a country that has been called the last dictatorship in Europe. The brutal Lukashenko regime in Belarus has time and again proven itself to be, in, uh, to be unrepentant in the oppression of its own people. Despite claims of reform by those in leadership positions, there have been no real changes in Belarus. Seems that that's the same script that all communist or communist-style dictators are using these days. It's the same facade that the Cuban dictatorship seeks to perpetuate. Hundreds of political prisoners remain in jail in Belarus, including two former presidential candidates and a well-respected human rights defender, and credible reports indicate these prisoners are frequently subjected to degrading and inhumane treatment. Even those who have, previously, who have, who have been previously released in attempted overtures to the West frequently are rearrested or face some other type of intimidation and retribution. Mr. Speaker, last year, the world watched as 700 pro-democracy protesters were arrested en masse. Their crime? Simply clapping their hands, their hands. This is their peaceful expression of dissent within the regime and fraudulent elections which kept it in power, for clapping their hands. And today marks the one-year anniversary of those protests and how does the dictator of Belarus choose to mark this occasion? He has had police summon a key democratic opposition leader and has detained several independent journalists. This clearly shows that the regime is not interested in reform, only in retaining power. Power through the muzzling of the opposition, power through the silencing of independent journalists, power through the repression of its own people. But as Mr. Vaclav Havel stated, there is great potential in people who are calling for their own liberty. The people of Belarus are actively calling for their liberty, and this measure before us today provides them with the assistance and the resources they need to continue their valiant struggles. I urge my colleagues to join us in showing our support for the people of Belarus by passing this important bill today. And with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of our time. Gentlelady reserves, gentlemen for Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I uh, yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen's recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this legislation. One year ago today, Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko staged a fraudulent election. After tens of thousands of ordinary Belarusians gathered to protest the conduct and results of that election, he arrested hundreds of them, including opposition candidates who dared to run against him. Last May, most of them were convicted and handed heavy sentences of up to six years in prison. Since then, the Lukashenko regime has continued to harass members of opposition political parties, human rights activists, and civil society, and to suppress Belarusians' access to free press and information. This summer, when citizens of Belarus gathered over several weeks to protest peacefully against Lukashenko and his regime and the deteriorating economic situation there, he had them arrested for simply clapping their hands. Just last month, the government tightened restrictions on the ability of civil society groups to receive foreign grants and placed even greater restrictions on peaceful protests. The Obama administration, to its credit, has led the strong international reaction to the fraudulent elections, post-election crackdown, and further deterioration of the human rights situation in Belarus. On February 2nd, 
the United States significantly expanded the list of Belarusian officials subject to travel restrictions and to having their assets blocked and restored full U.S. sanctions against Belarus's largest state-owned oil and gas concern and all of its subsidiaries. On July 2nd, Secretary of State Clinton met with activists from Belarus during her visit to Lithuania for a meeting of the Community of Democracies. She repeated her demand that Belarus release political prisoners and embark on the path of democratic reform. Just last night, Secretary Clinton and EU High Representative Catherine Ashton released a joint statement highlighting American and European concerns about continued human rights abuses in Belarus on the one-year anniversary of the December 19, 2010 political crackdown. In coordination with the European Union, the Obama administration has significantly expanded democracy assistance to the private sector in Belarus this year. These new resources will support the kind of assistance called for in the Belarus Democracy and Human Rights Act of 2011, which we consider here today. By passing this legislation, Mr. Speaker, we're doing our part to encourage the free exchange of ideas in Belarus and helping to ensure a brighter future for the people of that tortured nation. People who, like people everywhere, have the right to self-expression, self-government. I support this bill and encourage my colleagues to do the same, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves, gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so pleased to yield such time as he may consume to uh, Mr. Smith uh, from New Jersey, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health and Human Rights, a strong advocate for freedom everywhere, and the author of the bill before us. Gentleman from New Jersey. I thank uh, the distinguished chairwoman for yielding. And uh, just uh, join her first and foremost in mourning the passing of Vaclav Havel, uh, the great president, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, the, one of the founders of Charter 77, a magnificent human rights organization that took the Helsinki Final Act and turned it into a very durable and tangible program of action for the people of Czechoslovakia. Charter 77 has been replicated all over, including in Belarus. It's called 97 there, uh, and as well as in places like um, uh, Vietnam, where it's Block 8406. And all of these, these Helsinki-inspired, but Vaclav Havel-inspired uh, for sure. I would note parenthetically that back in the 1980s, uh, I and some members of the Helsinki Commission, including uh, Steny Hoyer, sought to meet with members of, of Charter 77. All but one, Father Molly, got through to our meeting. The rest were detained by the secret police, uh, and, including uh, Vaclav Havel. So uh, it's interesting and very important to point out that Vaclav Havel, before he passed away, tragically, uh, issued or sent a strong letter to the people of Belarus encouraging them to hold firm uh, and expressing his overwhelming solidarity with the people of Belarus as they seek their universally recognized human rights. Um, again, this man never ceased in his promotion of human rights anywhere, including uh, in, in his dying day, uh, sending this very important letter uh, to the Belarusian people. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do rise in strong uh, urge my colleagues to pass H.R. 515 again. We passed it last July, but it came back from the Senate with a couple of, 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 of additions, which are, which are very much appreciated. And I want to thank Senator Curry, as well as uh, uh, Senator Luger, uh, for their cooperation in helping to bring this legislation uh, back to the House. And I want to thank our distinguished gentlelady uh, for her leadership in Howard Berman, uh, as well as the um, Speaker and Eric Cantor again for bringing this legislation to the floor. Uh, this is a very timely piece of legislation. As was noted, it is exactly one year ago today since the bloody December 19, 2010 election night crackdown in Belarus, which swept up more than 700 opposition supporters, many of whom I know and know personally, who dared to challenge the rule of the Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko. On this day of remembrance, we are here in the House to pass legislation that we know President Obama will sign, he supports it, that demonstrates our country's support for the human rights of the Belarusian people, for democracy and the rule of law in Belarus through sanctions targeted against the dictator, Lukashenko, and his senior officials. 
This legislation um, uh, tracks legislation that I did in 2004 and 2006, which is current law, uh, called the, the Belarus Democracy Act. And it builds on that framework of trying to target those who are actually doing uh, the abuse. It's timely and necessary, as I said. Uh, those jailed, and remember, there are many who have been jailed and more that are being jailed as we meet, uh, have been subjected to degrading and humiliating treatment, and some have been tortured. More than 40 were convicted, and about a dozen, including several presidential candidates, remain imprisoned to this day. At a Helsinki Commission hearing that I chaired only last month, we heard shocking, heartbreaking testimony from one of the presidential candidates who had endured torture during his two months of stay at a KGB prison. And yes, Mr. Speaker, in Belarus, it is still called the KGB, reminding one how little Belarus has strayed from its dark Soviet roots. In addition to the arrested, the families, the lawyers, the independent journalists and democratic activists who are not yet in prison continue to be harassed and intimidated uh, and their homes uh, watched by the KGB. This has been the worst political crackdown in Europe in well over a decade. The post-election crackdown has followed the pattern, however, of repression that has characterized Lukashenko's nearly 17-year rule. Through a series of rigged elections, large-scale intimidation and suppression of independent media and civil society, the dictator has long consolidated his control over virtually all national institutions. His dictatorship has the worst record for human rights by far of any government in Europe. Specifically, this, uh, and, and significantly, the sanctions outlined in the bill are aimed at the senior leadership of a dictatorship that displays utter contempt for the dignity and the rights of the Belarusian people. With these sanctions, we stand with the Belarusian people and against their oppressors. H.R. 515 requires the State Department to issue a new report to Congress on the sale, delivery, or provision of weapons of weapons-related technologies or training, Lukashenko's personal wealth and assets, and cooperation by the Belarusian government with any foreign government or organizations related to censorship or surveillance of the Internet. H.R. 515 states a U.S. government policy of strong support for the Belarusian um, people in their struggle against Lukashenko uh, to live in a free and independent country where their human rights are respected. The bill encourages those struggling uh, w uh, over, despite overwhelming pressures from anti-democratic uh, regime. Calls for a full accounting of the 1999 to 2000 disappearances. This morning I was with a, a woman whose husband disappeared, presumed to be dead, uh, by this regime, and she continues to this day struggling for human rights on behalf of her people now in exile. It calls for um, and supports radio, television, internet broadcasting to Belarus, specifically Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, Voice of America, European Radio for Belarus, and the satellite television station Belsat. It calls for a release of all of the political prisoners. We can't say that enough. We can't say it one day and forget it the next. We need to redouble our efforts beginning today uh, to promote a free Belarus where all can live in peace and prosperity without that knock in the middle of the night by the KGB. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen from